Victoria 3 has to be one of the most beautiful and relaxing looking games that have ever been released. I can only picture it, you know, many of you probably come home from work, sit down and say I will tweak a couple of things here and there in the economy and politics of my Victorian nation and all of a sudden everything's on fire, you have no money and your entire country hates you. If that is something that resembles your experience with the game, then this video will definitely be for you. Because I have been sent a safe game by none other than the absolute legend Feedback Gaming. These days, he's an absolute master of Victoria 3, but back when he was playing the save game, he made a bunch of mistakes and we are going to try to fix them. We will lead this nation of people that don't feed their guests and love ketchup on pasta to world domination as it should be. Now if you yourself have a save like this one, where you think it might not even be salvageable to begin with, then feel free to send it to the email address that is in the description, I will check it out and maybe make a video on it where I will point fingers and hopefully fix everything. Anyway, let's jump into this one. Statistically speaking, I would argue that Sweden probably has the most bankruptcies in Victoria 3 because everybody plays them first, and everybody first kind of sucks. Uh, let's take a look at what he did with Sweden. He barely has an army, just 13 battalions, he has a GDP of 28 million, that's not bad, it's not great either, but it's definitely not bad. He has of course a very small population, and we can see right here actually that he probably had a bit of a civil war, that is what this gap usually means. Now what I can tell from this population is that he doesn't have much migration. I assume that he didn't really gear his laws towards it. The other thing is that he has great literacy and my god, this standard of living 21.7 in 1878 as such a tiny nation, that is really strong. The question is just, is this a justified standard of living or is he living above his means? So he does have a bunch of people that are very, very angry. 1.17 million radicals. Uh, I did already see that he is effectively suppressing them. He has level 4 law enforcement. Listen, if you got radicals, if you got people that are poor and hate you, law enforcement is the perfect institution. You definitely want it. It's like a, an easy problem solver. The problem that this doesn't solve, though, is the fact that all of these interest groups lose approval of us, and we really don't want that. Because if, for example, a strong industrialist faction, they are strong, were approving of us, we would get so much more investment pool contribution and man the investment pool currently looks absolutely dire 5.72k per week that's it in 1878 that is just not enough you can also see here that the people that are actually giving the money to the investment pool are people that own logging camps if you have a nation that is this highly educated that has such a high standard of living you want to sort of move on you want to move past the very basic production step which is the logging camp now the other thing that i'm noticing here is that he makes a mad amount of money out of tariffs in comparison to the rest of his income taxes uh, this is in the early game incredibly wise you want to export and import so that you can very quickly industrialize but in the mid game you basically want to create wealth within your country rather than tax wealth going in or out uh, what he did here was for the very early game quite smart he ran a crazy import export game but for right now it is a bad bad design decision because his whole economy is basically based on belgium france uh, some british and some austrian goods and that just can't be it we can also see this directly here in the buildings in Svealand. oh my god a level 124 trade center, 124,000 Swedes alone are, are working in Svealand, and then another 136,000 in Götaland. These two trade centers generate a lot of wealth and they import a lot of goods that otherwise would either not be accessible at all or would be incredibly, incredibly expensive. But they don't really bring in the wealth that, you know, Sweden of this time deserves. Now this comes down to something that I think most people actually don't realize. The trade policy of mercantilism makes it so that your trade centers will be run by shopkeepers. And shopkeepers sort of suck because they won't actually pay into your investment pool, ultimately making it so that you're neither really generating value because you're largely just importing it, and you're not really getting any share of it outside of your pops buying goods, of course. Now, building up a nation on econ and trade is totally viable. You can do it, but it won't build the strongest nation that you could be. If we look, for example, at the actual values here and how these pops buy their goods, you will notice that, my god, almost everything that they are interested in in this market is overpriced. The clothes make up 20% of their expenditures. But before we jump in and do any proper reforms or change our trade deals and so on, let's just take a look at the actual buildings in our states. Because what we can see here is that we are lacking market access, which seems to say that Norland, which only has 170,000 people living there, is a huge industrial hub. 
and it kind of is but it also kind of isn't so this is a mistake that i see quite a bit when it comes to you know playing victoria 3 when you come from for example hoi 4 eu4 or ck3 in those games if you build a building then it will produce something for you and you will be better off in victoria 3 it just doesn't do that a obviously you need infrastructure access and b you need to have population that can take care of these things now, in this case, this iron mine is hilariously enough the most productive iron mine in the world, but... Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Now, the other thing that needs to be pointed out, don't make this mistake. If you have a building, whether it is productive or not, whether it is filled or not, it will always use its maximum infrastructure usage. This means that, well, this market situation is straight up only happening because we got infinite iron mines here for basically no reasons. In a very similar fashion, he must have seen, oh no, my infrastructure usage is too high in Norland, let's build some railways, and it's the same exact issue. So we downgraded this to size 2 and hopefully can make it work from there. Alright, I have stomped in a bunch of buildings in all of our states. The only one where I will never downsize it are these coal mines in Scania. This is incredibly important to understand as a Sweden player, but also as any other player, basically. The coal mines in Scania are the only coal mines in all of Scandinavia. We can't access any more. Meaning, no matter what happens, come rain or come storm, we need to have these coal mines fully employed. This is one of the first bottlenecks that you will encounter when playing Sweden. You gotta subsidize that stuff and afterwards you need to look for more coal sources. Let's just take a look at our actual production methods. I really like that you already went and shifted all of these to publicly traded. I would mostly only do this with, you know, any corporation or any building. I mean, that was in a position of making massive profit, but it's not technically bad to shift this because this will give you more capitalists. And as soon as these buildings are profitable, will give you more investment pool. Anyway. In general, you don't have to actually take a look at these production methods all too often. You just need to set them and forget them. Since we don't really have the infrastructure here, I will remove this back to road cards. We don't really need the transportation there. The rest here, though, actually looks quite good. Uh, even the steam trawlers are already introduced. That is very, very nice. And then up here, we have an interesting situation. So we have set it to sewing machines and we have technically access to electricity, but we can't really afford running electricity. So this is a PM that we have, but shouldn't be using it. He definitely made the right choice there as well. What I can see is that we definitely do not have enough textile mills or furniture manufactories. And the tooling workshops, my god, aren't using steel tools. Is there a good reason for this? Um, I don't think so. Right now we're legitimately just not using steel for anything whatsoever. So I'm definitely going to re-gear this to steel tools so that we can have more tools and an actual usage case for the steel mills. You always need to make sure to see the bigger picture. What this actually... Oh my god, we're still on line infantry. Listen, listen guys, okay? Whether you're playing a peaceful, inwards, economic or trade-oriented game, you need an army. Having an army gives you projection of your power. Your power projection gives you prestige, which then makes it so that, you know, you can, for example, become a great power. And as a great power, you can gain people to join your sphere in a much more efficient way than if you are just a major power like we're right now. Having an army is never wrong. Oh no. Okay, so what this tells me now is that we technically have access to rubber technologies, but... Uh, <laughs> We have zero access to any rubber whatsoever. There's no rubber anywhere here. This means that we are currently falling behind the time in terms of industrialization. Yes, you can trade for things, but at some point, especially in 1878, you need to look towards colonies. There's one lucky stroke that we have here, and that is the fact that Denmark, somebody that is a prime target for us eating them, already colonized something. If we eat Denmark, we get land right here, and we will get our rubber. So let's keep that in mind. I think this is... Oh, no. Now, right here, we have a mistake. That is something that you should do once and then never again. Urban centers should never be forgotten. And if you've never even heard of them, then you need to now take note. Urban centers are things that are created automatically as you build buildings. Because these buildings will generate urbanization. And every 100 urbanization, you get one urban center. Urban centers are then used to generate services. And services is one of the easiest, easiest goods to actually tax. But 
if you don't generate enough, if you don't push these numbers, if you don't, for example, use glass for the market squares, then you won't be generating enough services for an industrialized and urbanized population, and you will be missing out in more than one way, trust me. So, what we need to do here without a doubt is get some glass into our circulation. Interestingly enough, we basically have zero and we produce basically zero lead at the moment, but we have to build it up as soon as we can. Now what you can see right here might look shocking, we now have actual more shortages than we had earlier, but don't worry about it too much, this is fairly easy to fix. We just need to go and import some wood from Russia and after that get some hardwood as well. They basically always have infinite because, well, it's kind of Russia, right? Now the two things that we still need to fix before we can jump in and make Sweden into the world power that it deserves to be is of course fixing our budgetary situation and fixing our diplomatic situation. First of all, the budget looks absolutely atrocious, truly terrible, now even worse than before. But don't be fooled. Um, you could say, okay, we're making a loss, we're making a big loss, we need to step up our taxation level. And I would say this would be a genuinely terrible choice. Currently, we have per capita taxation. I think that is probably what you will be spending most of your game with. And that is a deeply, deeply unfair form of taxation. Let's take a look at this. Land tax means you tax the peasants. They basically have no money and now you're taking money from them. And now they have even less money. It's a terrible choice. Per capita tax is way heavier on anybody that, you know, is a low earner compared to a high earner. Because paying one pound as a low earner hurts you more than paying one pound as a high earner. And then the income tax rate is also actually unfair towards anybody that isn't incredibly rich because the rich pops don't make all that much income. What the rich pops are largely making isn't actually called income, it is called dividends. And per capita taxation doesn't tax dividends at all. The first thing that does tax dividends is the proportional taxation that taxes the dividends tax with 35%. This is something that you need to consider because if I just push up this tax to very high, I am largely taxing people that already are very poor. But not just that. Having very high tax makes the poorer poorer, which are the majority of the country, also gives them a higher chance to become radicals and gives me less legitimacy to pass laws with. This would be a terrible, terrible choice. Uh, let's unpause this here for a second, just so that I can show you how awful this truly would be. Because if we study what people are actually uh, paying in a tax burden, you can see the lower strata pays 23.4% right now, mostly income and poll taxes. Then right here, only 20% still income and poll. And then right here, they have a burden of 11.1% of taxation. The rich are robbing us blind and that is just not okay. What we're going to be doing instead is target the rich specifically. We're going to go ahead and pass some consumption taxes. But before we can do that, we actually have to learn that we got decrees who are eating up our authority that we could be putting into consumption taxes. Hmm. Emergency relief, definitely not necessary. This is something you want to do if you, for example, have devastation or if you're in a situation where you're highly, highly urbanized and, you know, you have a lot of unemployed people. We have neither of this. We have too many free jobs. Now, the other thing is running a greener grass campaign and running that together with a promote national value campaign makes sense if you get a lot of migration. But if you look at us, you will see that discriminated pops aren't even allowed to migrate. And we have national supremacy, which in turn means that only Scandinavian folks are accepted in our countries. This means we don't get much migration and these are totally, totally wasted. Now let's get back to the topic of robbing the rich blind rather than the other way around. I love this. Look at this tax amount. We don't have to do anything. We might even be able to put down the actual tax itself if we just tax all the stuff that rich people enjoy. God, is this gorgeous or what? We're making so much money. Now I don't think that we should be putting down our tax burden just yet, but I will definitely put a tax on services. It is just so much money. And all of a sudden, I am back in business. If we are trading a lot, as this stage of the game, we don't really want to make money via tariffs. We want to get goods cheaper into our country, so no tariffs, and then make it so that our pops consume those, pay us taxes, pay consumption taxes or income taxes, and we make money off of that. This is how you build a strong consumer base. This means that our strongest trading partners, so France and Belgium, should be in our aim. We want them to form trade agreements. France will immediately agree. I'm a huge fan of this. Obviously, initially, this will lead to a loss because I no longer get the tariffs, but it does mean that the goods themselves become cheaper on our market and our pops will give us more money. And then right here, uh, we can't do it yet. I will just improve relations. I don't want to give Belgium anything in terms of an obligation. 
And oh man, look at that nice tax burden. We are up to 27.4% on the rich just because of the consumption taxes. If they're not willing to give us investment pool money, then I'm gonna take it via taxation. Yeah, and this is a curious number as well. Only 47 construction capacity, my god. The reason here is, of course, that he is not on steel frame buildings despite having the technology and this leaves us in a situation where we are building slower but we need to build buildings so that we can use this and then build faster. It's, it's a circle that you don't want to get caught up in so we have to make sure we need to build lead, we need to build glass and then we can jump straight into this. Now in general I have to actually applaud his laws here, I think these are pretty decent. If you have right of assembly you probably also want to grab guaranteed liberties just because it makes it easier to have more loyalists than radicals. And we definitely, definitely want to introduce some sort of election. The reason for this is that François Bernadotte, our totally Swedish king, is a landowner. And this means, since we don't have elections, that we need to have the landowners in government to get any decent amount of legitimacy. But the landowners have 2.2% clouds. It is terrible. I'm going to take in the industrialists for the moment and then switch to the census suffrage. Everybody loves it. And I think this should make everything else as far as, you know, moving, for example, to uh, free trade or protectionism much, much easier. Oh, and there they are. I love you, Belgium. I, I really do. Now, one thing that you always got to do if you want to go towards luxury clothes, which of course we do because we are incredibly rich, is you need to trade with China. They are the big manufacturer and they matter. I don't really care about North Germany right now at the very least, but I do care about the Great Qing. If you got an interest with the same strategic region as them, then you can trade with them. And we're going to make sure that we get our silk so that we can sell the clothes to the rich. All right, so now that we have glass, we can actually go ahead and build with steel frame, which gives us a lot more production capacity and hopefully allows us to, you know, build this up even faster. I think building some more glass, building some more explosives, that is the ticket of winning this game right now and look at that in literally no time we made it up to 39.7 million gdp because we are building up and we are building our very own economy rather than just depending on others now the other thing that i noticed he built literally none of is the grocery industry grocery industries are super super important in this game but whenever you want to build it if you don't already have any of these goods in your market the game will tell you don't build this this is a terrible idea I disagree, I will be building as much as I can because this will definitely just lift up the standard of living even if we tax our pops more and make it so that we have more capacity to move forward and industrialize even further. And what did I tell you? It's a pure money maker. Both the liquor that we are generating but also the groceries have a gigantic demand and every time you build more there will be more demand that is newly formed. You can see right here the buy orders increase on a weekly basis and with that the people that can actually work in a profitable food industry increases as well. It is incredibly recommendable to build food industries whenever you can. And look at that we're already up to 47 million. Look at this jump. <laughs> <laughs> now a big part of becoming a great power means that you also need an army. As I said it gives you projection but more importantly it also makes it so that you can actually establish yourself be that for colonies or be that against other powers. And for that we will actually need munition plants. We now do have shrap artillery but obviously can't equip it because well you know we aren't producing any of this. Oh man and I am so incredibly happy that we're getting this. This will make the industrialists very unhappy but I am actually honestly kind of okay with this. We didn't get census suffrage it was a negative check but we can simply force it through. Elna Brusevitz is a hero. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Oh lord. The intelligentsia communists. Ah. Uh. <laughs> I don't really want to turn fully communist, but hey, we might. Now, this is exactly why I love elections. We have two big winners. It's the Radical Party and the Patriotic Party, and I'm going to put both into government and then make sure that their agenda is fulfilled. You can see it right here. They are in the Radical Party, for example. They want to be a republic. They might want universal suffrage. Now, I'm not saying I will pass any of these, but as long as they stay in that party, we will benefit from the new legitimacy of the government. I want guaranteed liberties, and I want... a. Uh, at some sort of healthcare system, maybe private insurance, but you know what, for the moment, let's take guaranteed liberties. This will make it easier for us to gain supporters and harder to gain radicals. Big, big fan of this. This will keep you stable and this will keep your population happy. And a happy population means that your interest groups are even happier, which then gives you bonuses. Always make sure to take a look at what bonus you want and how to get it. All right, folks, it's military Sweden time. The barracks must be built and the walls shall be won. So we have now become a great power and this puts us in a position where we have a pretty decent amount of battalions as well. 
and I think it's time for Scandinavia. Dear Denmark, you have to join us because you have a bunch of resources and colonies that I really care for. So I think I'm just going to declare war on you. It should be a fairly easy war. I don't reckon that anybody else will come in, but if so, I will crush them. Oh yeah, look at that. I... <laughs> you love the sight of this. And here you can see what recovery rate actually does for you. Yes, we are losing troops, but it is almost a straight line because of how aggressively we are also recovering after the battle. Denmark will fall and then we shall be Scandinavia. Oh, here we go. Guaranteed liberties. I love this law. I love this institution. We have so much over when it comes to our actual bureaucracy that we can definitely go ahead and enforce a bit of it. I want more radicals. Uh, sorry, I want more loyalists and fewer radicals. Oh, and looks like I caught the Danish Navy raiding. And this just isn't fair. My god, man of wars against monitors. Yeah, bye-bye. And there you got it. Denmark is ours, and I think this should settle the question, who is the overlord of Scandinavia? It's us! We formed it, and with that, we now have something very tedious to do, which is going through every single location to see whether we need to get rid of buildings. And here, quite clearly, come on, man, I, I basically have to close down the entirety of this, because all we want from the north, uh, northern part of Norway is, of course, the sulfur and the whaling. My god, I need the oil so bad. Another thing that almost everybody forgets in their first playthroughs is to actually incorporate the states that they just conquered. Uh, I'm gonna incorporate all of these because they're all, you know, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, Icelandic, whatever, so they will just fit right in even with our citizenship laws. Uh, and here we have what we came for. Denmark is nice, but it's so flat, who cares? There's nothing there of value, but this rubber, this beautiful fruits, the coffee, the sugar, the dye, all of this is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, this is going to be beautiful. Now that we have no way in our market, we can actually go on and produce even more groceries. This is the dream. You want to build that up and then our standard of living is going to go up. It technically went down here because <laughs> poor Norway is, uh, yeah, a bit underdeveloped, huh? You know what I also noticed? Uh, we don't have any new coal that we gained from actually conquering what we just conquered, but our neighbor being in here does have coal and I think it is time that we take over. And oh damn, Benin just gave up. And to me, all that means is it's coal time. And oh my god, are we bottlenecked by the coal? But not for long. This is why I keep saying that you need to make your moves. You need to make your moves very early on when it comes to this game and when it comes to your economy. Sweden alone just does not have enough coal, enough sulfur, enough oil, enough rubber to actually get things done. And look at them go. This, this is the ticket. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have a, a secession. That's not good. Yeah, I, I don't enjoy that. They are, of course, rightly very angry. All right, so now we have this massive, massive rubber plantation, and we will immediately use that to produce elastics. These elastics will then allow us to produce way more in terms of luxury clothes, which then in turn will yet again drive up our standard of living. And already, by the way, you can see Norway has recovered. In spite of everything the AI has attempted, I have built them up to be a massively, massively rich location. Oh wow, and we immediately actually have private schools now. That is a, a huge boon for us. Uh, strengthen the Intelligentsia actually even further. We might go communist, quite frankly. The Intelligentsia is very powerful now. You can never have enough rubber. We're using this for all sorts of things now. We already are the fourth great power. I think we're winning at this point. All right, now it did roll incredibly unlucky with the industrialists, but they do now finally have a market liberal. And this means that they, at the very least, you know, are okay with protectionism. They hate it just as much as mercantilism, but mercantilism will make a big, big difference for us. And so we're switching. See, isn't this just a much nicer number? Our tariffs effectively stay the same overall, although we are trading for cheaper with Belgium and with France. But our income taxes, now that we have an actual consumer base, are so much higher, as are, of course, our consumption taxes. And my god, on top of that, our investment pool is slowly but surely getting to where it actually needs to be. Oh my god, Hamburg. What are you doing? It's a council republic. <laughs> Less. The landowners are leading a council republic, excuse me, together with the militarized KPD. Huh. And now, welcome to the world of tomorrow. It took me a while, of course, you have to always make sure that you balance out your call, that you are ready to take the next step, but now that we all of a sudden have a whole bunch of power plants, we can talk truly and genuinely expanding our economy. Electric sewing machines, here we come. And this right here, by the way, is what guaranteed liberties on a very high institutional investment can do for you. 
2.4 million loyalists and less than 1 million of radicals. This is exactly how you're meant to play a fairly free nation. Now, admittedly, we're not too free, but we are kind of free. Oh, and this is so lucky. The very first attempt, public health insurance passes. Now, public health insurance, I wish we had had way earlier. And I really wish um, that, you know, he basically had implemented it even earlier because this will turn down the mortality, which is the best thing you can have for a nation such as this one where you just don't have that many people. Our dear, dear Intelligentsia now actually turned anarchist. They don't want anybody involved in anything. But you know, it's actually kind of interesting. So I stuck with the base design of Scandinavia. I liberalized, of course, the country to a certain degree, but largely I just modernized its laws. I didn't really do anything that wasn't already in the motion. But I think I might actually move in against the monarchy. Look at this. The intelligentsia loves it. The armed forces love it and the trade unions love it. Of course, against it are the landowners, the industrialists and the Church of Sweden. Now, the industrialists are not currently in government. They are very powerful, but they're not giving me the investment pool bonus either. I might just turn this ship around fully. We, we once had 80k investment income here, but yeah, the industrialists are no longer boosting us. You know what? Why not? Now, something that we are still missing because we have most of the other resources at this point. Of course, we got coal, we got uh, all of the dye, fruit, and so on, but we are still missing opium. And Kutschir is not affiliated with anybody and should be fairly easy pickings. Oh, and I just turned into a council republic. <laughs> that is so funny. All right. Well, there you go. It is time for the worker cooperatives of the world to stand together <laughs> and get this done. We can say, uh, say goodbye, of course, to our investment pool, but our tax income. Oh, you'll be so happy to see it. Trust me. And there, my friends, goes the upper class. <laughs> it is so funny. And I think with that, it is actually time that we turn towards proportional taxation. This means that all of the people getting dividend shares, which are now not just the upper class, but the middle and lower class, that they would also be properly taxed. I can go a bit back on the consumption tax rate and we will make an incredible amount of additional money. This is how you build up a society that is taxable in its entirety because everybody's incredibly wealthy. And then you crash the party and just give all of the power to the proletariat. And oh my god, there you go. Now we have proportional taxation, which in actuality means that I can basically roll back most of these taxes in, or well, I could, I should say. I don't think I'm necessarily going to do this, but let's observe how the change of taxation actually happens. We have a 20% change right here, budget dividend taxes. Okay. Um, and then right here, we have 31% on the middle strata. That is pretty heavy. I think we can take away a couple of consumption taxes and we will still hit them pretty hard and make a lot of money. So if we take this away, we will now release the middle strata of a bit of pressure, making them hopefully a bit richer. And you know what, let's take this away as well. We're just going to stay on the medium taxation level as is, in the hope that this, you know, a 25% tax rate and an 80%, 18% tax rate, which is totally fair. Now, with at least a pretty decent navy underneath us, the red navy, of course, and then a pretty good red army, I think it is time that we start showing the world what our power really looks like. Uh, for starters, why don't we take a little bit of Finland right here? Ah, statistics. Yes. That is exactly what I, what I thought was happening here. Ah, it is beautiful to be ahead in tech, or rather to be ahead in implementation of tech. You can see it straight up right here. They are dying like flies, but what you can also see is that we quite literally now have a flat line because our recovery rate is so high that they straight up cannot damage us in any way. This will be a true disaster for Russia right here. The way they have literally no recovery rate is absolutely sickening. They have already lost 200k wounded and 70k dead. Oh, and there you go. Scandinavia is ours entirely now. Hmm. Curious. Hmm. Curious indeed. Is this is this the North Korea flag but Swedish? <laughs> really? Huh. <laughs> Damn. Um we're an anarchy now, I guess. And with that, I think we have brought enough industrial hellscape into Stockholm. This time, everybody's rich, but we are a bit of a weird anarchic mix. Either way, this save is saved. 
send me one of yours, and I'll see you then. Later. Alligator. <laughs>